Criticus, I see you have diffused my objection, but I must tell you your argument leaves me more convicted than really convinced. If anyone in Einstein's world was more convicted than convinced, it was Friedrich Adler in late October 1918. By then, the imperial armies of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany were on the run. Einstein wrote to Adler on 20 October, wondering who between us will be the first to manage to come and see the other. Who can know? Within days, the emperor was urgently pleading for assistance. The Social Democrats were hovering above the levers of power. Desperately, the old Council of Ministers offered amnesty for all political prisoners if they would only apologize. Adler would not. Fritz Adler emerged from the Stein Fortress when, on 1 November 1918, the Habsburg Empire had fallen and was immediately greeted as a hero of the working class. It took little time after his release for Adler to clash with his father. It was to be their last confrontation. Victor died on the 10th of November, 1918. Turbulent times. Both Friedrich Adler and Einstein advocated for a socialist, internationalist position, but one that would eschew the anti-democratic drive of the Bolshevists. Einstein went to one of the soldier worker councils to plead for democracy and on 13 November 1918 pressed for a national assembly. All true Democrats, he said, must be vigilant lest the old class tyranny of the right be replaced by a new class tyranny of the left. Force breeds only bitterness, hatred, and reaction. Adler, too, was similarly vocal in his challenge to the dictatorial left. Despite such increasing doctrinal tensions within the left, in January 1919, Lenin and Trotsky offered Adler a position of honor in the Third International. Adler refused. Adler, at this point, far more famous than Einstein, did worse as far as Lenin and Trotsky went. He joined the center-left Second International, only to split with them because they purged the Bolshevists, and then more decisively in 1920. In short order, he had created the political version of his privileged frame of reference, where he could follow no laws but his own. Lenin returned the compliment. He denounced Adler in December of 1918 in favor of a dictatorship of the proletariat. Trotsky dubbed Adler's position the second and a half international. Unlike Trotsky or Lenin, or the increasingly restive second international for that matter, Einstein already, by 1930, sketched the Adlers in an elegiac light. Einstein, of course, by then, had left ordinary physics fame behind. From the moment the pacifist physicist Arthur Eddington had announced the bending of starlight in November of 1919, Einstein was the subject of poems and polemics, architecture and arch enemies. In 1930, Emma Adler, Fritz's mother, wrote to Einstein, I write you not as the world famous Einstein, but to the Einstein who years ago spent an unforgettable evening with us in the Blumengasse asking if he would contribute to a memory book of Victor, Fritz Adler's father. Einstein recalled their day together in 1911. In the older Adler, Einstein saw a man whom every political camp trusted, a philanthropic spirit that grasped human frailty, a vestige of an older, tolerant Vienna, no longer imaginable in post-war desperation, a priest-like figure of a forgotten patriarchal past. Were such a man alive, Einstein ruminated, perhaps the powers at Versailles would not have erred so tragically. No saint-like priest he, Friedrich Adler, never quit making trouble. He infuriated the communists by lambasting the Stalinist purges. He protested against the Popular Front. He rejoined the Second International, then blasted them for refusing to oppose Hitler during the opening salvos of World War II. During one of Adler's speeches, Léon Blum, the French socialist, leaned over to his neighbor and whispered, he shoots better than he speaks. 
Fleeing to New York from Belgium in 1940, the Nazi capitulation found him in apartment 14C on West 106th Street, just off Central Park West. Dear friend, he wrote to Einstein on Mercer Street, Princeton, in June of 1945, I was very happy to see you personally again. Not missing a beat, Adler plunged into socialism and relativity. The world changed utterly and changed not at all. Adler moved back to Zurich after the war, working on a biography of his father, living until January of 1960.